Hi guys, Nick here from Conservation Careers and welcome to the podcast. Now, how do you conserve a species which is incredibly hard to see? A, a ghost species, if you like. Well, that's the challenge of today's guest, Helen Turnbull, who's the CEO of the Cape Leopard Trust in South Africa. And the Cape Leopard really is the stuff of legend. It's seldom seen and highly elusive, surviving some of the most inhospitable habitat possible, the rugged mountain ranges of South Africa's Western Cape. And here they come into conflict with people, or more specifically farmers, who see them as threat to their livestock. And this is where the trust comes in, to ensure the long-term survival of leopard population by promoting peaceful coexistence and protection of landscapes, empowering scientific research and positive community partnerships, along with education and advocacy. Now, in today's episode, I talk with Helen about the amazing work of the Trust and how they tackle such a complicated issue. We also discuss her fascinating career today, which has taken her from working for an airline for nearly two decades to being a business owner, working in sustainable partnerships and tourism, to where she is today, leading conservation efforts for Cape Leopard across South Africa. Now, it's a great story, and we start with Helen providing an overview of the work of the Trust. Enjoy. Um, my name is Helen Turnbull. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Cape Leopard Trust, based in South Africa. Um, I live in Cape Town and our work has, stretches across the Western Cape province. Um, the Cape Leopard Trust is a small non-government organisation which was founded in 2004. Um, so we're talking you know, um, 16, 17 years ago now, um, which in itself is good for a small NGO. Not all NGOs managed to survive for, for such a long time. Um, and our subject is very interesting because it, um, it really looks after the smallest cat in the African continent in terms of leopards. So we uh, we look after the, the leopards of the Cape. We don't call them Cape leopards because they don't have a different genetic structure to the savannah leopards, but um, a lot of people call them Cape leopards. It's just the way it comes out. But actually they're not different to other leopards. That's the main thing to say. So um, the CEO, the first CEO of the Cape Leopard Trust was the guy who discovered that leopards were still in, in existence in the Western Cape. And what shocked him originally when he started researching leopards was the fact that there was so much persecution and so many leopards were being killed by farmers indiscriminately. Um, and Dr. Quinton Martins at that time was a, a safari trails guide and then decided to study leopards of the Cape and, and then became the, the chief executive officer. So, um, yeah, the leopards in the Cape are fascinating animals because they are obviously the same as other leopards, except their body mass is about half the size, uh, but their territory is 10 times larger. So it's a very difficult animal to track. So lots of, lots of space is needed for the leopard. And that's why we don't really call ourselves an organization that looks after just one species. We like to make it an organization that uses the, the leopard as an umbrella species to look at much broader environmental issues. Because if we don't have spaces open for leopards, then obviously that apex predator is threatened and all the biodiversity that sits in that layer underneath the leopard is also threatened. So we use it as a, as a, a kind of surrogate species to describe um, the challenges that face conservation in the Western Cape, which is fragmentation of habitat, um, increasing urbanization, um, also fire, regular fire from the fane boss, which happens, and then illegal hunting. So the Cape Leopard Trust actually has three approaches to doing its conservation work. Um, it's research, scientific research, and published research, which is really important to go with the actual ground work. Um, education, we have a very strong environmental education component of our work, because without education, you're never going to achieve the conservation that we need to get all the generations and the people around us to understand the whole dynamic about um, about conservation. And in the recent publication of the Das Gupta report, I don't know whether you've read, read it, Nick. Um, you know, we have to realise. Yeah, I only read the abridged version, but um, yeah, the 600 pages seemed a bit daunting. But actually, it's interesting to see that finally some some vision that there may be some kind of economic model put around the value of, of nature and that hasn't been done yet 
So, so the Cape Leopard Trust really is many things. It tries to approach conservation on a very diverse level. But um, the fact that we've got a successful formula has, has worked for us for 15, 16 years. And, and now we have uh, an opportunity to really scale up our conservation work in the Western Cape. So we've always approached it very innovatively. So last year in lockdown, for instance, we wrote and published a children's book where we couldn't get out to kids in the areas where we were working. We actually published a, a very good book, which had a section of a story and then some leopard facts and then um, also some activities. So we used that as a tool when we were not able to access children. And then mo most recently, we've seen a huge increase in illegal hunting with wire snares in the Western Cape. So one of the research papers we recently published was about what's driving this this uh, situation where we've got increasing threats, not just to leopards, but to the prey of leopards and broader biodiversity with these snares being set uh, indiscriminately, basically. So it was interesting because there, some of it was traditional hunting that people actually thought their fathers had hunted like that. And so for them, it was a source of food. Some of it was traditional medicine. Um, some of it now, of course, with COVID is increasing social uncertainty and economic uh, livelihoods have been threatened by COVID um, and seasonal workers as well come into the Cape for the grapes and the fruit picking and obviously then when they don't have work will have to resort to, to snaring and things like that. So we, we try to be innovative in that our approach looks not just at the, the leopard as a one species but also just looks at the, the broader picture. Yeah, fantastic. That's a great introduction and an overview of, of your organisation and what you're seeking to do. I'd love to kind of rewind the clock a little bit, actually. So you said that the person who, who set up the organisation sort of rediscovered this population of leopard around mm -hmm. the kind of west of the Cape. So had it been overlooked for years? And if so, you know, how had it, how had it gone sort of unnoticed? And also as a follow up, like what, what's the what's the kind of conservation status of the leopard? You've touched on some kind of issues there around snares and things, but yeah, what are, what are some of the particular issues that it, it faces? So, yeah, two questions in there. You know, what, what's the history? Was it overlooked? And, and what's the kind of conservation status and issues that they face? Sure. I think um, the leopard in the Cape was, was supposed to be alive and thriving, um, but people never found them. And they've just become so elusive because they've been heavily persecuted. And so when Quinton set out on his quest, um, to see if he could find these elusive leopards. The idea was to, to look to see how many were actually in existence in the Cedarburg as the first core area for the Cape Leopard Trust. It's a big, wild, mountainous, rugged section of the Western Cape, um, inhospitable and a perfect fortress for leopards because it gives them a lot of protection because it's very wild. So his work was, first of all, to look how many leopards there were, to see where they were living, what they were eating, and to work with the farmers really to see if you could find a way to stop the persecution happening. If you look at leopards overall globally, the IUCN rates them as vulnerable. Um, there are different leopard species around the world. And I think the fascinating thing about the leopard is it's probably the most adaptable big cat of all big cats because it has populations, pocket populations in other countries where other cat species don't exist. And the other thing is that in, the, in South Africa, it's the last of the big five to still survive roaming free in the Cape. Mm -hmm. And it's because of that adaptability. Yeah, it can adapt as conditions and things change, change its food source, change its behaviour, yeah, mm -hmm. to keep going, keep thriving, yeah. Yeah, so Quinton actually was very, he's a very visionary scientist and also very determined. And during this time when he was trying to get farmers to look at leopards differently, um, the farmers really were not very happy that he was around um, because for them, the leopard is the enemy, the arch enemy, and anything that happened to livestock was blamed on the leopard. So leopards had a really tough life at that point. But over the years, as he consistently worked with the farmers, a group of farmers in the Cedarburg decided to sign a conservancy agreement and they decided they wouldn't use lethal management methods anymore. So the terrible gin traps with teeth that the leopards would get caught in with their paws and the terrible injuries they would suffer were outlawed in that particular area. And that still remains quite a nice blueprint for what the Cape Leopard Trust achieved in its, in its startup 10 years. And, and that really has inspired a lot of the journey going forward that we've kept our alliances with farmers very close. 
Uh, we realize that livelihoods for farmers, you know, means they can't afford to lose livestock. <laughs> However, the threats to livestock have become very different. So it's not just the leopard now that threatens the, the, the livestock. It's often uh, other other predators like jackal and um, jackal and caracal primarily in our area. But on top of that, you've also got things like community dogs that run wild and they form a pack, a hunting pack, and then they will also attack livestock, not necessarily to eat, but just because it's a, a kind of group activity, if you like. So a lot of the work has become um, working closely with farmers to analyse who actually killed the, the sheep and we set up a kind of CSI type um, site of the prey and, and the predation incident and then look at the bite marks and also to see where the animal was dragged, what signs show that it was a leopard, where are the tooth marks, um, because that's really important that you say to the farmers it may not necessarily be a leopard because all of a sudden you can get a very difficult situation where a group of farmers will be out with their rifles ready to shoot the leopard and that's the last thing you want. Um, and obviously training farmers to say it's not good to shoot a leopard because cats have a, a territorial instinct. So by killing one cat, it doesn't mean you'll be free of leopards. You'll just produce a situation where there's a vacuum and then all of a sudden you'll have a couple more fighting for, for that same um, territory. So it's not a simple solution to work with farmers and relationships are key. And that's one thing that we are um, extremely proud of is the fact that we have really strong relationships with the agricultural sector, with the government sector, with Cape Nature Conservation, which is our government led conservation organisation um, and with other NGOs as well. We, we use our resources in partnership with other NGOs where we can. And that's been particularly useful during COVID times when obviously our income was quite restricted with the the um, economic challenges that faced everyone around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, so the farmers are key in all this. And, and if they if they find some livestock that has been um, killed by an animal, do they actively then call you and call you in to come and investigate that scene? Is that relationship so strong that they actually, you know, they call on you as an organization to come in, understand what's happened and then advise them on, on what they can do? Because that really shows kind of quite a deep partnership actually, if that's the case. Yes, and that's how, how it works. And we work, well, we've just done a camera survey around Picketburg area in the Cedarburg where we identified over 50 individual leopards in quite a small territory. Um, and the farmers do call us. They say, you know, well, I've lost eight sheep, but I'm going to lose my patience at 10. So some of the farmers are very conservation minded and are willing to live alongside predators um, but there comes a time when that, that patience wears very thin. So we have a community outreach officer who's available full time to react to predation incidents like that. And that's been a, a new role we assigned two years ago. So that we're not just a team of researchers, educators and, and conservationists. We also actually have um, responders. And then last year, we also invented a predation register to share with the farmers to help them to log their predation incidents to see how often it's happening and what the actual um, predator is that's happening, you know, causing the incident. And then this year we are trialling in that same area because there's such a huge amount of conflict. We're trialling different mitigation methods. So that's the next stage. We don't want to leave the farmers in the lurch when they're struggling. We need to be there uh, handholding in a way to say, OK, Let's look at this realistically. How are you dealing with your livestock and how can we create a situation where they will be looked after better and we can look for signs of what's going to tell you if a predation is going to happen. So we're testing a, a, guard, a donkey guardian system this year where we'll look to see if, if donkeys as, as anti-predator measures will work in a flock of sheep, for instance because we know feral donkeys get very defensive. They're, especially if they're female, they get very bad tempered. And so sometimes that's enough to scare a predator away. Um, there are some incidents where farmers will get very upset and they'll call Cape Nature to bring a cage and they will try to capture the leopard. And sometimes if a leopard's captured and then released, that's enough of a shock for it not to come back again. So all the time we're trying to um, help the farmers to realize that if we're going to work in harmony with nature and farming, then we really have to understand 
what predators are doing and why they behave like they do. So it is um, very much a supportive relationship um, with the organisations in the, around us and with the farmers. Mm. And it's really fascinating, you said at the beginning about leopards being like a flagship species. So by focusing on leopards and this kind of apex predator, if you like, and, and work with the farmers to help conserve them and understand them and to understand what they can do to work and live more in harmony and still protect their livestock. Do you see additional benefits for other species then across, you know, across the Western Cape through your activities that are also benefiting not just leopards, but, you know, other other species that kind of, you yeah, know, that kind of spin off benefits you like of your activities. Yeah, I think uh, reduction in poisoning is often yeah. a good side result um, because sometimes farmers will poison, and obviously, if if um, an owl or another raptor eats the the poisoned mouse, then obviously that doesn't just kill the owl; it kills a lot of other stuff around it. So, um, the caracal is another species that we try to get the farmers more um, sympathetic towards. They call it the Roy cat here in South Africa, the red cat. Um, it's got, it's very attractive. It's got pointed ears and little tufts of fur, which react very sensitively to sound and change in them, in uh, any movement they, around them. Um, and then snakes as well. I mean, obviously a lot of Africans are extremely frightened of snakes, but we try to say, well, look, if you kill that snake, you're likely to have rats in your house. Can you maybe think of it in a different way and, um, you know, realise that snakes are more frightened of us than we are of them and they will do their best to move out of the way. So try not to kill them, but encourage them to move. But obviously, if it's in your house and you have to call someone. But um, but I mean, it is it's a case of um, predators shouldn't be seen as our enemy. They um, and also it's not our space to govern. We're actually in their territory, if you like, and we have to um, accommodate nature because we need nature a lot more than it needs us, put it that way. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and particularly around leopards, I mean, obviously there's a conflict there with farmers and, and, and that particular population, but more broadly across South Africa, you know, how do people think and feel about leopards? Are, are typically people proud of them? Do they like them? Are they scared of them? What, what, what sort of reputation do they have in the population? I think in South Africa generally, um, everybody knows that there's a, a great economic value on leopards, particularly for safaris, because it's a bucket list animal that you want to see and also the most difficult cat to spot. Um, they're very good at hiding. Um, I think in across all of South Africa, we're going to get the same farming conflict. Um, and I don't know whether you saw recently, there was a very large leopard killed um, in Botswana that had yeah. threatened livestock and and actually they, he was shot, which was very sad. But, um, you know, the farmer had obviously reached the end of his tether. I don't know whether there was any intervention done there, but, um, but leopards are really precious cats because they're solitary hunters. They're not in prides. Um, they are animals that con control the ecosystem um, and make sure the balance remains there. So as you take those animals away, and uh, there's a lot of a lot of things that happen in a farming environment that you can't reverse. So once the predators are gone, you get terrible attacks from vermin. Um, you know, there, there are problems with other things. You oft, often see overgrazing because there's no nothing to control um, the animals that are in the area and, and then often land erosion. So it can be it can be a situation where there has to be a way of, of getting people to live together. But I think generally people value leopards and are very um, inspired by them. I think leopards inspire art and fashion and uh, people are always really excited to see leopards generally, apart from the farmers. Um, and I think that's that's the thing we have to push, you know, that these animals, it, the world would be a lot poorer without leopards, put it that way, and on many levels. And even our South African currency, the main highest nomination of our currency the 200 rand note has a leopard on the back of it so um so i always think you know when i joke with people they're, they're the top of the tree and they need to stay that way so on our currency for instance we have um the rhino on the 10 rand the elephant on the 20 the lion on the 50 the buffalo on the 100 and the leopard on the 200 but if you look at the rhino and the lion and the elephant really under persecution at the moment with poaching um, you know, and really, how are we going to manage that situation? Because 
during COVID, actually, there was quite a decrease in poaching incidents for the other animals. But after COVID, it's been kind of declining and there's more movement of people and we're seeing the poaching going up again. So we don't want to see this crisis situation with the leopard. I think we all should make an effort to say, let's see if we can set an example with a leopard. We may not be able to change the situation for the others now. Um, and I don't know how serious the, the rhino situation is currently, but it is pretty serious. But let's look to the leopard as a, as a kind of icon and say, you know, we need to make sure we do everything we can to protect this cat, which has globally been adaptable and survived on its own. And um, as a survivor, it should be celebrated. Yeah. And I think I'm right in saying there's about a thousand leopard in the Cape. Is, have I got the numbers about right? And if so, how, how optimistic are you for the future of the leopard? Projecting, say, 10 years forwards, you know, mm. what do you think, you know, the population might be doing 10 years down the road all, all being well? Yeah, I think the um, the Cedarburg area where we first started, we've done two camera surveys now and the population has stayed fairly stable. And that's obviously helped by the inhospitable landscape and the conservancy arrangement with the farmers. Across the Winelands area, we've got a situation there where there's not much livestock farming, it's mostly wine farmers. So for leopards wandering around the grapevines, it doesn't cause a great lot of concern to the farmers. Um, we've just finished our second survey there since we started the organisation, and I'm hoping the population will be fairly stable there. Um, if we go to the next section we're going to do is the Oberberg, which is a brand new survey area for us. Um, we understand there's quite a lot of conflict there. So that will be interesting to see as a baseline um, what, the, what the animal total is, the leopard total, and then in a couple of years again, survey it again. So we've never, in the Western Cape, there's never been a leopard map done in the Western mm -hmm. Cape at all about leopard movement and where they found. So there's very little information. So that's what we plan to change now in the next five years, to create um, a threat map or and a habitat suitability map for leopards from information we can collect. And then periodically resurvey these areas so that if there is a change in the population, we immediately know there's something wrong. So only by having that information and investing um, a lot of capital into the systems that we put in place will we know if the leopard's in trouble. Yeah and how do you go about surveying for these leopards and how easy are they to see? Um, I mean I was on your website earlier on and there's a great short YouTube clip saying can you spot the leopard <laughs> which I watched for about a minute and I couldn't spot the leopard anywhere but it, obviously it must be there unless you're tricking us I don't know um, <laughs> but also using camera traps at night to take images and set locations but I mean how many wild leopard have you seen in your study area and how easy would it be for someone to go out and, and actually see one? I mean, is it, is it one in a million or are they more common than that? Yeah, I've had researchers that have been on our project and never seen one. That's how right. bad it is. So um, I'll often have the, a camera crew from the BBC phone and say they want to come and film a, cape, a leopard in the Cape and, and they've got a week. And I say, well, unfortunately, as much as we'd love to have some exposure about our work, I'm sorry, it's not worth you coming. Um, so the, the camera surveys are really our best uh, way to spot leopards in the Cape. And the great thing is they're like cheap field workers, really, because they can stay out all night and all day. <laughs> and they only cost a small amount of money. And the leopards will actually come up to the cameras where they would never come up to a person. There's a scent there. So you know for sure that they're not going to come out. Um, and they just stay hidden. They're probably there watching you. In fact, one of the um, tourism lodges in the Seedberg, Bushman's Clough, which is quite famous, um, one of our team, or well, about three researchers, were putting a camera up in that area. And uh, Bushman's Clough had a safari drive, a night drive coming out, and they shone a torch up on the mountainside, and the researchers waved and they carried on doing their work and put the camera up and then went back to Bushman's Clove reception to collect the vehicle. And the guide said, wow, did you see the leopard? <laughs> and the team said, no. And they said, yeah, the leopard was sitting there watching you all the time. <laughs> so I thought that was quite ironic that the leopard was sitting there watching our team when our team were putting the camera out to try and spot the leopard. <laughs> So, so the, the simple answer is that, no, it's very rare to see a leopard. Um, you know, I've seen one dead. I haven't seen a live leopard in the Cape yet. Um, if you keep driving the roads in Cedarburg, you think you see a flash of a tail. Um, and so it's, 
it's very hard to see them yourself unless you actually have to go out to collar a leopard or something like that or assist with uh, with an incident it's very rare that you'd see them in the wild and that's what makes them so special um, and also we have in South Africa obviously an environmental act um, which determines where leopards can be hunted so the Department of Environmental Affairs every year sets a, a quota for leopard um, you know, obviously for us, we we can see that sometimes some areas may be, um, there may be two leopards or too many leopards considered safe in an area. Um, but in the Western Cape, we've always fought to say no hunting at all because we just don't know how many leopards there could be in the Cape. Um, and the getting the information is really hard. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges for raising money for an organisation like ours because People say, I'd love to come out and we want to raise some money for you. You, you can you can reach, see a leopard. And um, and the sad thing, of course, is that you can't show them a leopard. And so yeah. you, know, you have to be honest and say, we love you to come out, but you have to be prepared for the fact that you probably won't see them. Yes, yeah, so you're not raising money for a ghost, really. And that sort of leads me on quite nicely, actually, into the, into the next part of our discussion, actually, which is about you and your role. So you're... You're the CEO of the Cape Leopard Trust, and and part of that role is fundraising for this charismatic but incredibly elusive and hard to see species. Um, I mean, how 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 do you describe your role as CEO? Because you know, as a as a fundraising director or as a scientist in research, I think we understand exactly what those roles probably entail. But a CEO is is it can be many different things. And and how do you describe your role? And what does what does success look like for you in your position? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, well, I think for me, the main part of my role is to coordinate all the moving parts. So I really see it as a role where you're steering the ship. Um, you're making sure that everybody has what they need, all the equipment they need. They don't have to worry about resources. We've got those in place. We we do a lot of financial planning um, so that everybody has what they need. The education team can go out and see the children. We've got safe vehicles. Um, and also the main role, I think, for me is um, the fundraising aspect. I don't have a, a fundraiser. Um, we made a decision in the Cape Leopard Trust that we'd have a, a kind of um, a support system with a consultant who could help us when needed, but that each of the teams has to play a role in fundraising. So they understand how difficult it is. So we'll set up a, a proposal for a, for a, a particular project which will start off with the team and then I will take it further maybe and go to the various partners and look for the money. So we all play a very active role in it. And I think that makes it all the better when you're actually successful in the, in the funding you get. Um, so relationship building is very much part of my role. Financial oversight um, in South Africa, there's quite a lot of governance involved with running a charity, um, the Department of uh, Social Development and the Department of um, well, the South African Revenue Service keep a very close eye on charities to make sure everything is done transparently. So it's up to me to make sure all our systems are in place and there's no, nothing left unturned when it comes to accountability. And mm -hmm. um, what do you enjoy about your role? The particular aspects that you you look forward to, or particular bits that stand out that you you, you most you know enjoy doing. Well, it's sad not to be in the field, obviously. I miss that part of the work, but um, I like the I like the challenge of looking for funding and trying to form new partnerships and finding alliances that work. So, you know, the charity sector has changed considerably. So we we actually work on partnerships. So we look very much for brand alignments when we're looking for funding. So we'll look for something that really um, matches with our with our brand and we'll look for something where the other party will get a benefit. So for instance in South Africa there's a seven day cycle race called the Absa Cape Epic and the cyclists cycle across a lot of the areas where leopards roam. So I actually approached the organisers of the Absa Cape Epic to see if we could become aligned as a charity there um, and they set up a charity model where we buy five entries at the full rate and I get to sell them, but I can negotiate with my buyers on top for, for a donation. And because the race is so popular around the world, like all the entries sell out in an hour. Um, it means that if I sell the five entries, I can make a quarter of a million rand if I'm lucky, just by negotiating a, a donation on top. 
So it's, um, and then last year, for instance, with COVID, um, the education team were very much under pressure financially. We didn't have any income coming in. The children's book idea was something we've had on our back burner for many years. And then in the end, I said, let's do it because it was a very good team building exercise for us as a, to, to make sure everybody felt safe and um, unincluded during a time when there was a lot of uncertainty around the world and having something magic like a children's story to make. Um, I dipped into some of our reserves to make the book happen. But on the other hand, if we sell the book in retail, we'll make a small profit for the education project for each item sold. And also we donate a book to a rural child. So um, you have to really try to not cross the fragile line of, of causing a risk to the organization, but not being afraid to take a risk if you need to, to increase your financial, um, your financial position. So it's a fine line. You've got to also realize that you can't always just wait for money to come in. You have to be very proactive and get out there for a successful organization you have to be looking at every opportunity yeah and it sounds like you've got to be quite innovative quite entrepreneurial as well and yes uh, what i like what i'm yeah. hearing as well is, is is sort of shared responsibility through the team sometimes mm. people do have a fundraising manager and all the pressure sits on their shoulders to raise the funds and it's sort of passed off to them and everyone yeah. else can go off and do their work but you've actually delegated across the team and everyone has a shared duty to do that Yes, and, and yeah, that, that that must you know elevate your game actually collectively, make everyone think and everyone become more entrepreneurial. How can we raise the funds for this project that we believe in? Absolutely, and also you, you know with the you know then that you, the brand message you want to get out there is correct, that you have control over what's being messaged, and that's really important when you want to build build a strong brand, um, and get partnerships on board. So last year during COVID, we managed to secure a UK charity partnership with JAMA International. Um, and that's a five-year partnership for leopard research across the Western Cape. So it's that kind of thing that, um, you know, it was a difficult year, but we still managed to do something pretty remarkable. Mm, that's great. And how did, just on that instance, how did that come about? Did you proactively go out looking for strategic partners, come across them, make a connection? Did they come out the blue? How did these things, how do these things happen? Well, that came, it came out of the blue. They had known uh, somebody, we work with the Zoological Society in London with Dr. Raj Amin. Um, he's a technical partner for the Cape Leopard Trust. He volunteers his time and support, which is really good for us. Um, and he put us in contact with JAMA International, who wanted to find a small, a smaller grassroots uh, conservation organisation doing something interesting. Um, and we set up a, a call in January, but then... By the time I'd actually negotiated the agreement, I think I'd written the, the application again about four or five or six times to make sure that we we actually aligned with what JAMA were looking for and the vision they had and we'd aligned it properly. Um, and sometimes if you, if you don't have that capacity in your organisation where you can all sit together and work as a team to look at, you know, an insight into what they're looking for and what we can also deliver, um, you, you, you're not going to get that partnership. So it was a case of everybody pulling weight and just sitting down and making sure that we got the partnership. You don't let it slip through your fingers, basically. Yeah, great. No, that's fantastic. And long may it continue. It's interesting how the connection to ZSL made an introduction to someone else, these partnerships. I mean, it's funny. It feels like the charity sector is a place where people do look for collaborations and partnerships, whereas in the business sector, everyone's seen as sort of competitors, you know, if you're doing the same thing, whereas charity, if you're a similar mission, you should be working together and I think that's a great example of how that, that can work these connections can form yeah sure, for sure. Yeah. I think conservation research particularly is is can be a siloed affair um yeah. and that's changing fortunately I've seen a shift in the years that I've been with the Cape Leopard Trust where there is a lot more collaboration happening whereas previously people could have been quite protective of their research area their topic their expertise mm -hmm. right got you yeah so I'm interested in your career then before the trust. Now you, you joined the trust and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, 2015? 2013. 2013 and three years later you became CEO, right, 2015, I've got yeah. you. So before that, what 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 have been your kind of main career steps? Can you just sort of paint us a quick picture of, you know, what, what, what have you done through your life that led to where you are now? Okay, well you can probably hear from my accent that I was I was born in England 
And then I came to South Africa when I was a teenager. Actually, my father came up for a project here for five years. So I finished my high school years in, um, in the Northern Cape in a very small town um, on the edge of the Kalahari area, the Kalahari. And so that was my first introduction to large open spaces and, and vast African skies. So um, it was a taste, although I didn't appreciate it at all at the time as a teenager because the, the last thing you want to be interested in is nature and after I finished school I came back to the UK and um, I must say I was quite disappointed with the lack of space and I felt a bit hemmed in after being in the Kalahari the big place the big space but um, yeah I settled into the UK and um, and then became homesick and decided to um, try and get home when I had no money. So I um, I applied to the, all the airlines whose languages I could speak and I got a, a, got work with Lufthansa in the end. So um, I worked for an airline for 16 years. That was the, what I did just to be able to come home to South Africa. And, and in that time, I became quite interested in um, the way that um, aviation looked at carbon footprints and um, flight efficiency and things changed where they looked at biomimicry. So the end of the, the wings that um, have the dihedral turn up these days were modelled on, on birds of prey. You know, they'd observed nature's efficiency of flight um, with the tail feathers of the eagles and the birds of prey that turn up at the side. So they, um, you know, airlines are very proactive. They've got to keep their operational costs down to a minimum. And so they sometimes look broader than just technology, which was heartening and I also worked for an airline who had some um, environmental commitments they support crane conservation and they also support white shark conservation so I did that for 16 years and then um, my young son was about three at the time and my husband had um, retired as a doctor so we decided to move to South Africa back to um, and I'd always said I would live in Cape Town if I came back so then I set up my own business because I had seen the 2004 white paper on tourism, which said, if we're going to have anything to do with tourism in South Africa, it has to be something that will benefit the communities and benefit the environment. So I set up a business which was essentially training tourism opera operations to incorporate sustainable development into their business plan. Um, and that was back in 2001. So it's quite early in the days of sustainable development and environmental awareness. Um, but it was what I believed in. And during that time, I worked with a, a marine conservation, a marine operator, um, well watching operator that then set up a trust called the Dyer Island Conservation Trust. Um, and I became quite drawn to the marine wildlife environment and did quite a lot of communication around um, helping Africa's penguins who'd lost a lot of their habitat because of the guano being sold over the years as white gold and a vital ingredient for explosive and dynamite. Mm -hmm. So I got to learn the stories behind the, the, the problems with conservation. And then I was working with a game reserve in the Eastern Cape called Amakala. Um, and it was when poaching suddenly escalated. And I was working with um, Dr. William Folds at the time and his family. And so I got involved with trying to raise funds for setting up a first responder team for injured rhinos that were found alive after a poaching incident. So I would go with him in the field and treat the minor wounds of the rhinos, which was at the time quite harrowing because nobody knew how to heal wounds were associated with poaching incidents. But it was a very successful project and um, went on to be financed by a larger organization. Um, and at that time I'd met the CEO of the Cape Leopard Trust and asked him if I could help him because he was looking for funds to expand the project. And I did some fundraising for him through my tourism business. And then one day um, he asked me if I'd like to join the project as his assistant. So I had an opportunity to do that and um, did a lot of his administration and operational ordering and of equipment. I wasn't really involved in the field. And then in 2014, he got a very exciting opportunity to move to the US to work with Dr. Rodney Jackson on the Snow Leopard Trust. Um, and he left very suddenly for America. So um, there was no one really, um, at the time, there was no time to take on a CEO. We looked for one and I continued to manage the trust in the meantime, just as a, as a ma manager. 
and eventually the trustee said well you, you know you seem to be pretty good at this job so um would you like to take it on so so it was quite um interesting i would say i never thought i'd be capable of it and that's why i identified a lot with the the women in conservation podcast about you know you always think you're not up to that position you know you're, you're not good enough and but i think um a lot of the times i've always been someone who has um, pushed the boundaries in terms of doing jobs that maybe were more shaped for men, um, particularly in the airline industry and things I'd learned there. Um, and then, you know, also growing up with a father who uh, was very interested in steam trains and we renovated steam trains at weekends. So I think um, that determination was what served very well when it came to thinking, okay, well, I'll give this a try. The worst that can happen is it can fail. Um, and so I always call myself the accidental CEO. Um, one day I should write a book about it. <laughs> but I think that what, what I've seemed to be good at um, across the board with all of the organisations I've worked with helping to set up their trusts is, um, is putting a business model around the organisation so that it is properly structured. And that, that thing, those sort of things really, really matter. So you have very passionate researchers and conservationists working on a project, but they're not always business minded. And I think that's what makes the difference is having that insight where you can say, OK, how can we make this better? How can we look at scaling up? How can we partner to make it a much better organisation, make it fit for purpose going forward? Um, and I think that's the advice I would give to anybody that wants to come into the conservation field is definitely go out and volunteer or join a project like you've got Wildlife Act or any of these projects in the countries that you want to go to and realise that conservation is such a broad spectrum of roles that even if you don't get into the position you want to be in the beginning, you can try something different first and work your way across. So um, never be defeated. I think if you're really passionate about what you want to do, try something even if it's not the ideal role and just work through it and find your place and eventually it comes. That's great advice, that's great advice, yeah. And it's really fascinating you joined our Women in Conservation webinar that we ran a few weeks ago, but there's a, a, a fascinating discussion actually about the challenges and opportunities faced by women within the sector. Mm -hmm. um, and you're a great example of success in the sector. And actually there are many you know, female uh, director generals and CEOs now kind of rising to the top, you know, and long may that continue. But what, what particular challenges do you think women face within the sector? Do you see any particular challenges or have you even felt any challenges through your career that you'd like to share? Uh, I think um, I think really there are a lot of sections in conservation which won't consider the opinion of a woman. Uh, that's one thing. Um, when I was working in the airline industry, it was sometimes a cultural thing where a particular culture wouldn't allow a woman to be in a management position. You can get similar examples like that in conservation. Um, but I think the main thing is to uh, remain resolute and um, stand your ground and just make sure that people listen. And if you're passionate enough about it, I think you can overcome any, any situation. And, and I think Nelson Mandela said, it's always impossible until it's done. So you really just have to grit your teeth and there will be opportunities or situations where you find yourself in where you're not comfortable, but learn from it. Don't see it as a bad thing and, um, and just get yourself out there and strong and face whatever comes ahead of you. That's what I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, if there are people interested in uh, perhaps working for the trust or working for similar organizations, when you're when you're hiring for staff, you know, and people are applying for positions that you have, um, how do you how do you choose applicants? And you know, what what do successful applicants do that helps them to stand out? Have you got anything you'd like to share that might be useful around that as well? I think uh, it's interesting when we put out positions, we always get applications from around the world, and it's always very hard to um, to choose because you have a lot of people who obviously want to work in the sector. Our um, adverts and our vacancy notices always go out on social media. So the main thing for anyone who's interested is always to follow our Facebook page and watch our website. That's where any vacancy notices come up. Um, we tend to more, if we're looking for interns or volunteers, then we tend to be a little bit more um, broader with, with who we will select and look at. 
And, and it's often very useful to have a, an international student working with us or an international volunteer because you get a different perspective. So it's not that we would rule anybody out. Um, the main thing is sometimes the because we're a very small team and we have to work in a way that's efficient and we can't afford to waste resources and our time's very under pressure. Sometimes we don't have the luxury to to take people that we might want to, but we realize that practically we can't. Um, but we do have people that apply time and time again um, and do become successful in the end. And that's a, something I would say. I always also take a make a point of writing to people and thanking them for applying and saying, you know, don't let this put you off. Please keep, you know, looking to see if anything else comes up. Um, because it's not just about us, it's about that person who also can say that the Cape Leopard Trust cared enough to actually acknowledge my application because there's so many occasions where people don't even get an acknowledgement. So I think it's important to build up a relationship and, and encourage people as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I fully support that. And it takes a lot of time and effort to put an application in when you don't hear anything. It can be really disheartening. So just a small one minor thanking people is, is a really nice, yeah, really nice thing to have done. Yeah. Um, have you got anything that, I, I'm I'm sort of conscious you, you didn't sort of switch careers. You went from the airline industry and sort of travel and tourism into sustainable tourism and then into more kind of conservation and wildlife. You sort of you graduated across and sort of back to your roots from you know sort of your teenage days in South Africa, really. But there are people who listen to this who are doing something quite unrelated. They might be bankers or teachers or lawyers or, or any any you know job that they feel that isn't really a conservation job right now. They, their passion is to switch careers across. Mm. Have you got anything you'd like to, to to share or say to them? I mean, do you see people switching careers successfully into the sector, and and what sort of routes or or things should they bear in mind? Yeah, people do switch, and um, and I think t in today's world, there's a bigger realization that there's more to life than money. Um, there's more to life than maybe doing a job that's nine to five and you don't ever question it um, because I, I would never, well, I've always been kind of someone who thought about starting my own job, my own business. But sometimes when you're caught in that rat race of working nine to five and getting home and back in the same thing tomorrow, you, you kind of just don't think it's, you're capable of it. So I would say that anyone can make a switch and um, if they want to make a switch for their quality of life or because their uh, belief has changed in the way they want to live their life, um, I would always say that, you know, it's, it's one of those things you have to do. You know, there's no time like the present. I think if you really believe it's what you want to do, somehow that, that talent that you have from whatever vocation you've come from, there's always a place for it somewhere else um, in conservation as well. So... I would say make the switch and and don't think twice about it if you if you are of that mindset and you're you feel as though you're bogged down in your current job and you're not feeling the satisfaction that you want to feel and um, and I think if you can find a job where you get up every day excited to do it and happy that you're doing that work and um, your life is so much better anyway. That's what we all want isn't it absolutely mm -hmm. yeah and conservation needs good people and, and so many skills that people have with them can be transferred across Absolutely. So that's, that's fantastic advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we normally sort of round off the podcast just by asking some very open general questions just to kind of hear your thoughts and opinions, really. And one thing I asked and I enjoy asking really, is that um, what do you think that, that conservation needs to be better at? I mean, we're still, you know, we, we're doing some great work as a conservation community across the globe. We're helping to protect species and sites and, and ecosystems and working with communities and doing all this amazing stuff. You hear great positive stories all the time. But at the same time, I think we are losing the battle. You know, wildlife and biodiversity is being lost at a greater rate than ever before throughout our history. So, you know, why why are we as a movement in some ways failing? What do we need to be better at? What, what should we focus on more? I think we, we need to be more committed to evidence-based science that has the opportunity to guide policy and push for that policy to be put under the government's nose and in other words, when there are cases where you can see that land use will influence a species survival, then make sure that you've done sound science and have evidence that you've collected that you can present that has a very strong case. 
um, with whichever government you're working with and get it to the nature conservation authorities and then don't give up. I mean, really, policy change is the only thing that's going to help us in this situation now, I think. Mm, interesting. To make the really big shifts within society to, to scale up, yeah, mm. now on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. and if necessary, um, join hands with other organisations to, to have that power. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I guess as a follow-up question to that, if I could... If I could sort of sprinkle some fairy dust and make you a, 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 a czar for the day, a global czar for the day, and you can act, a, you can enact a new law, a new policy that would just have to, it, it would just happen, and a policy that's designed to try and help protect the the planet to to help to save the environment. Um, what 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 law might you enact? Mm. Um, it's an interesting question. <laughs> I think I would um, have a law for nature where I would put a price on every tree and um, a price on every species so that when there's a, a plan put in for a building model or a, a block of flats, actually, you know, every little thing that like a tree that produces oxygen or, um, you know, things that produce water, mountain catchment areas, that there's an actual economic value put on that that says, okay, well, this is the economic value from the environment's perspective. This is the value that the flats are going to bring us. But, you know, what's going to, we need those other things to survive. How does that balance out um, and have a, a law for nature, basically? Yeah, so really valuing nature, this natural capital, ecosystem services, whatever we want to call it, but actually putting a, yeah, a financial value on that brings it into the marketplace and helps to protect Absolutely. it all. Yeah, 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 fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Alan, it's been so nice talking to you. Nice to get to know you a little bit as well. Thank you for sharing your precious time with us. If people want to find out more about your work, particularly the Cape Leopard Trust, where, where should we go? Where should we send them? Well, we have a Facebook page uh, for the Cape Leopard Trust, and we also have a website, which is www.capeleopard.org.za. And, um, you know, we welcome any people who'd like to join our social media campaign and uh, follow us and learn about our work and, and help us to um, to really ensure the long term survival of these really special leopards. Fantastic. We'll link to those in, in the show notes as well and below this video or whether podcast, wherever you're listening, you can find those links as well. Thank you so much for sharing your time. It's been great to get to know you and good luck with, with all your work, Helen. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you, Nick, for your time and, and the time on your tablet with your computer failing. <laughs> thank you. It'll be boot soon. <laughs> Have a lovely weekend. And to you. You take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, everyone. If you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation hyphen careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.